providing creative, innovative, and economical solutions. Um, she also worked at uh, UW in Milwaukee, where she participated in ergonomic research. Um, and then Sumatomic has 16 years of experience working in the field. Um, 12 years is spent assisting in, um, employers in minimizing the risk and increasing productivity. Um, she has worked five years at UW Milwaukee, where she taught and participated in ergonomics research. Um, she holds the highest level of ergonomics. Um, this nation has a board certified professional ergonomist. Um, she's completed extensive in depth analysis work of workstations, where she's examined over 2,000 employees and or work sites um, throughout the country. So, please help me and welcome you. So, thank So much for having us here today. Um, I'm just going to say a few words, and then my partner in crime here is going to start out. Um, she obviously came. We plan on having her here because I, you know, what will happen. We, we weren't sure if I was going to make it today or not, but um, I'm really happy to be here. And you know, with ergonomics, it's, it's the presentation is going to address multiple different types of facilities. Now, how many of you have an active role in ergonomics in your facility, whether it be through safety? HR, anything like that, great. Um, we'd like this to be real informal, so please feel free to ask questions. A lot of the, the pictures that we have up here are specific to some industrial type settings and some office type settings and things like that, but it's hard to address the whole realm of, of what you see out there in ergonomics. So um, with that, Sue's gonna kind of start out and she's gonna um, talk a little bit about um, some of the classroom type stuff when it comes to ergonomics and then I'm going to jump in and we're going to just do some case case studies and uh, some field work get you out on the field and kind of walk you through that process so and again any questions just feel free to ask us as we're going through it okay um, Mary kind of went over the uh, objectives but we're going to talk about um, the what is uh, ergonomics and the importance of it in in the scope of a uh, safety and wellness program because I think it all goes kind of hand in hand. We're also going to talk about some similarities and differences between the different types of reports that, that um, are out there in the field of ergonomics and what they're useful for and how they can help to communicate with different parties. We're going to um, talk about assessing ergonomic risk, what are the important issues, what are the risk factors that you need to look at, you know, put on your ergo eyes when you're out walking about or, or when you're talking to um, patients or injured workers, um, what, what uh, kinds of things you're looking for, and then does ergonomics really work? So with that, uh, we're just going to start with a little bit of a textbook definition. Um, ergonomics is a science that is concerned with the design of equipment, facilities, operations, and environments to match the capabilities and limitations of people. That's a mouthful. But basically, ergonomics is fitting the job to the person. That's, that's our, our main goal. Um, in doing so, we need to look at everything that touches, impacts, comes close to, uh, affects the worker that's in the middle of this um, little uh, diagram. So we look at work environments. We look at things like heat, uh, cold, um, noise levels, lighting, things like that. We look at job tasks, um, such as what are, is there rotation? Um, is it a repetitive type of job? Is it an assembly line work? Um, do you have your own um, are you, do you have your own ability to mix things up during the day, or do you have to follow a certain routine? And we look at tools and equipment, um, and that's kind of self-explanatory. But all of that affects the worker. So one would think that when you have all of this information gathered, you'd be able to develop the most wonderfully ergonomic workstation for everybody. But the worker is also variable because those buggers come in different sizes. So we, need, we really need to look at all of those things that affect the human, but then we also have to look at the human in the middle of that equation because a five foot two person might be standing next to a six foot two person doing the same types of work. So how much is too much? Really what we're looking for is what is safe? What is safe work? for the working population. And that has that whole range of, of people in it from the smallest female to the largest male. So what is safe for all of those people? And in ergonomics, we do have certain design criteria 
and thresholds that we use to design jobs so we can make it safe for at least 75% of the working population. Because if you can design for 75%, and usually it's the female 75th percentile uh, that incorporates 99% of the males, but if you can design for the 75th percentile, then you can take those case-by-case -case basis um, types of uh, situations where you need something a little extra special um, to accommodate some outliers, what, what I call outliers. So the really, really tall person or the really, really small person. Sometimes you have to make special considerations for that. What we're trying to mitigate is strain. So, and strain occurs, uh, and those are those musculoskeletal types of injuries, the strains and sprains that we hear about, not the slips, trips, and falls kinds of injuries. But strain occurs when the job physical demands, what you have to do to perform the work, outweighs what the worker is capable of doing. So we want to switch that um, equation around so that we always have the worker's physical capabilities larger and greater than what is demanded to, to perform the work. <clears throat> Goals of ergonomics, lots of different goals, but these are probably the standards. Um, number one is to decrease errors, accidents, injuries, and illnesses. And when you do that, you do that in ergonomic design by making people feel uh, more safe and more comfortable at their workstation. If people are more comfortable and feel that they can work safely, that's going to decrease fatigue. It's going to decrease that extra energy needed for extraneous movements. And it's going to automatically, as a byproduct, increase your efficiency, productivity, and your quality of your product and quality of work. So this is what we know. We know that all of these factors affect ergonomics. That they all affect the worker at work. There's physical factors. Um, we don't have control over that as employers most of the time. Things like pregnancy. <laughs> Things like uh, diabetes things like um, the aging workforce, those kinds of things. There's psychosocial factors, job satisfaction. Do I like my boss? Do I think my boss thinks I'm important? Um, do, do I get along with my coworkers? That seems a little silly, but with all the research that Mary and I did at UWM, that has a huge role to play. Actually, it's a more important role to play in some circumstances than the job physical requirements um, in terms of what constitutes reporting on injury. Um, personal uh, uh, risk factors also, those other things like the, the diabetes and, and those kinds of things. And then proactive versus reactive. We know that proactive ergonomics is much better than reactive ergonomics. It's better for cost, it's better for injury prevention, it's better for morale. Um, there are a lot of excuses, though, that we run into when we go into a facility and, and ask, why is this workstation designed this way? Um, a lot of times it's, well, we didn't have time. It was uh, product demand, customer demand. We had to get it done. We had to get started. So we didn't have time to do our due diligence. Um, sometimes it's too expensive. We didn't want to put in that lift. Um, we didn't have the capital dollars for it. Sometimes it's, well, you know, ergonomics is such common sense, we shouldn't have to tell workers um, how to lift the right way. They should know that. Or, oops, I didn't think of it, but my all-time favorite is the ugly baby syndrome. Um, you never want to, you know, an engineer, and I am one, so we never want to hear that our design is ugly. We think that whatever we put out on that shop floor is supposed to work because we think it's supposed to work. So um, those kinds of things are the excuses for not um, doing uh, good ergonomics. Why ergonomics? Well, basically and, and simply, it is the right thing to do. When, when we have a machine that breaks down, let's say it's a, a million dollar piece of equipment or a $10,000 piece of equipment, you can get a replacement part, you can have your millwrights or your mechanics work on that piece of machinery. And, and with some replacement and maybe some dollars spent, you can get it back up and running, probably as good as new. However, if you have a worker that has a rotator cuff injury because of what they're doing at work, 
it's not that easy to repair and replace that. So your workers are just as important, if not more important, than all of those pieces of equipment that you have in your facility. Um, and we have to treat them as, as such. Ergonomic related injuries um, typically account for 40 to 60 percent of injuries and 50 to 75 percent of all workers' compensation costs. This is national data, by the way. Um, it also, and this is just, they're just talking about medical expenses here. They're not talking about those ancillary <coughs> expenses like uh, days away from work, uh, retraining of other people, temporary staff that you need to fill in because you have injured workers. They're not talking about all of those other costs that can be seven to nine times as great as just the medical costs. They also, um, good ergonomics helps with productivity, so if you don't have that there and you have an injury, you're going you're gonna to get hit in, in productivity and quality um, areas of your work too. And then there's that little thing uh, called OSHA that can zing you um, on some of those uh, ergonomic issues if they find them. This slide just simply illustrates that we have more effectiveness if we incorporate uh, ergonomics into the conceptual phase of the designs. So when your design engineers are thinking about putting a new line in or thinking about ordering a new machine, if they also think about the ergonomics of it, at that point in time, that's going to go a lot further than having to revamp things down the road after the equipment or process is already put in place. Same thing here. We have much lower cost when we incorporate ergonomics into the, into the uh, conceptual design than if we wait until afterwards. Retrofitting something or changing something after it's um, already been put into place is much more costly. For example, yesterday I was at a company, they ordered a million dollar piece of machinery and the engineer didn't think about um, the height of the machine. So they didn't dig a pit to put this huge piece of machinery in. So now instead of uh, taking a six inch step, workers have to take a 23 inch step to get into the machine to, to take their measurements and things. So now they're going to have to build a platform because it's too costly to, to dig that pit. It would cost them probably $50,000 to dig the pit now. Um, but now they have to spend probably about $15,000 to make a platform. So those kinds of issues because they didn't think about it until they saw it in real life and next to the workers and thought, oh, this is not good. So what do we have in the field of ergonomics? in our arsenal? How do we help employers, insurance adjusters, um, doctors, how do we help to communicate with all of those entities? There's the job description. And this is, um, most employers have job descriptions. And a lot of times when Mary and I go on site, we'll ask, do you have job physical demands reports? And they'll say, oh yeah, we do have job descriptions. And they'll hand us a job description that says, must have high school equivalent education, uh, must be able to lift up to 80 pounds, must be able to work weekends, those kinds of things. And they think that that's, that's their physical demands. However, that's not a good, really good tool to communicate with, let's say, physicians when you need to get workers back to work. Up to 80 pounds occasionally, does everybody, you know, sometimes that's a blanket statement for the whole company. Does the secretary really have to lift up to 80 pounds, or is it just one person in, in a certain department within the plant? So we, we help to clarify those kinds of things. And that would be the job physical demands reports. Um, and we're, we're going to get into all of these in the subsequent slides here. But then we also have risk screening tools that really look at what are the ergonomic risks here? What are the, are, are there things here that could cause those musculoskeletal type of strains and sprains? And how can we uh, make recommendations to mitigate that? And then we have the ergonomic, full-blown ergonomic assessment that we use um, for things like determining causation. We don't determine causation, but we can communicate the um, risk factors and uh, safe and unsafe parameters to the physician that has to determine causation. 
Um, and also, a lot of times when you have to justify, a company has to justify a large piece of equipment or redoing something, they need a return on investment and they need to see, okay, at this point in time, what are our risks, where are we going to, and what's the potential for cost, and if we get this piece of equipment or change things around, what's our risk then, and then we can help them with that. So, the biggest thing is don't get caught up in the nomenclature. Lots of different, there is no right or wrong term for any of these types of um, tests. We just use these terms to separate them within our company, uh, but a lot of people call them different things. So um, don't get caught up in the terms. Just simply, if you want some type of report or want some type of information, explain to that person that's doing it for you what your goal is, what information do you want to share, to whom do you want, with whom do you want to share that, and what is your goal out of that kind of um, data set. Uh, and then that person who's doing any kind of ergonomics consulting should know what information they have to get to you. Okay. So this is just a, a chart. It looks really confusing, but it's really not. Across the top, it just has um, the different um, types, the different tools that I kind of went over. And down here, it just has communication. <laughs> Who do we want to communicate with? We want to communicate, let's say, with the employee. Of course you're going to need a job description because you're going to have to tell them what that job entails, what they're you know, uh, signing up for here. But you also might want to uh, communicate physical demands. You might want to also con uh, communicate there, there's risk here. How can you help us to redesign things and make sure that we're all safe here at this workstation? You might also want to um, involve them in a process later on. When you communicate with, uh, let's say, with a physician, they really don't care about the job description. They don't care that the person has to have um, training in, in forklift driving or they have to be available for the second shift and first shift. They want to know, what does it physically take to do that job? If, if I have a person who has a rotator cuff and I want to get them back to work, what am I getting them back to? Can they do that same job? Is it safe for them to do during the transitional recovery period? Or do we have to have a conversation with the employer for some kind of transitional duty? What can and can't they do? And I think because a lot of companies don't have that kind of physical job demands report, that's when we see um, things from the doctor coming like, um, cannot use torque wrench. Uh, unable to, um, or, you know, one-handed work only. Um, because they, they have to be that global because they don't know any more specifics. So if they knew more specifics about that job or about the transitional duty jobs that, you know, that were available, then they could get more specific in their um, restrictions. Just to add to, um, and I'm sure you've all run across it, is employer, employees that are injured will completely exaggerate what their job duties are. I lift 100 pounds repetitively. Well, the doctor hears that from them, and without having a real detailed physical demands report, that's what they're going to go by. So it's a great communication tool with the docs, too. Yeah, it is. Mary's right. And I, actually, I just saw a, a physical job demands report from a company that um, you have to be very careful who, who does that also because in that physical job demands report, it said that the employee has to push slash pull 7,000 pounds. <laughs> and it said, you know, how much, how much force? It said 7,000 pounds of force, 1,000 to 7,000 pounds of force. Now, your load might be 7,000 pounds, but there's no way, unless you're Godzilla, that you could, you know, <laughs> push 7,000 pounds of force. I think, you know, anything over, you know, 60 pounds of force, you're, you're looking at, you have to make a change. So, you know, so that's, um, the company is doing the right thing in concept, but they don't have whoever they had do them, and, and I don't even know who, who did their reports, but they weren't necessarily qualified to, to measure the right kinds of information. So that report really <coughs> isn't very helpful. Um, um, mechanism of injury and um, assessing risk. <coughs> When we talk about mechanism of injury, what we're looking for, again, 
is those sprains and strains. Could the job duties or the job tasks or the parameters of what you're looking at have caused a certain type of injury, okay? We don't determine causation. We only look at mechanism of injury. And so we're looking for things like awkward postures with forceful movements with high frequency. One of the, like, if you just see awkward postures, that doesn't really mean that much. It, it could or it couldn't, you know, contribute to an injury. If you see high frequency, that doesn't even mean all that much. Um, I always use the example of Lucy in the candy factory. You know, she's working really fast, but there's really light force, you know, ne not necessarily going to cause a, a repetitive type of injury. Um, usually if you see a lot of force, um, that's, that's a red flag. But if you see all of these things together, or any combination of these things together, that's also a red flag for injury. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those types of things when someone asks us to go investigate um, causation issues. <clears throat> now, we only look at that mechanism of injury. We look for the circumstances under which an injury can occur. So if you're talking about a shoulder injury, but there's no force and there's no above shoulder work, everything is real close to the body, there's probably not a real mechanism of injury there. If you're talking about someone using tools overhead and things like that, then that's a different story. Um, then we take all of that information, the objective information, and we send that off to whatever doctor is going to see that, and they have that job of identifying the most likely cause of a worker's condition of disability and demonstrating that it arose out of the workplace. So they need this piece of information <coughs> so that they can make this determination. And thank goodness we don't have to make that determination. I don't want to do that. Okay. Um, this just shows that there are different um, things that we use in the literature. There's a lot of epidemiologic data that supports or negates certain things that go together that can lead to injuries. Um, and we always want to make sure that we hit it here. When we get a case for causation, it's already kind of too late for, for, for that individual. Um, it'll possibly help with other individuals in that department or anything, but we want to hit ergonomics when, when we hear of discomfort or fatigue. And that could be verbal, or it could be when you're walking through a facility and you see things like um, duct tape around handles, or um, boxes on the floor so people can rest one foot on it, um, foam taped around backs of chairs. Those are all warning signs that people are actually telling us, hey, there's a problem here and I'm trying to work through it, but they're not verbalizing it. So you always have to have those ergo eyes on when you're walking through or um, when you're asking questions uh, of people and kind of keep all that open. How should we control cumulative trauma disorders? Well, we control them from all, all directions. We want to be preventative and proactive. We want to be able to detect them by walking through or by getting information about, you know, since, since we got that new drill, my hand's really been hurting, that kind of thing. That's, that's a warning sign. Um, and then we want to react to those, to try to mitigate as much as we can to um, not have it turn into an injury. So one question for you is, what is the most important factor in minimizing risk when lifting? Is it the vertical height of the object that you're lifting? Is it the horizontal distance away from the body? Or is it the, the sheer weight of the object? What do you think is the most important? What about this one? Show me hands. What's the most important? You're right, it, they all are important, but what is the most number one most important? Is it vertical? How many say vertical? How many say horizontal? And how many say weight? Okay. Actually, it's the horizontal distance. And we have models and, and different ways that we can show that um, to people when, when, uh, when we're doing a, a study. Okay. Now, 
take, for instance, these two uh, photos. This gentleman over here is reaching into a bin. So he's reaching down, and he's also twisting while he's lifting. So he's going to lift up and <coughs> twist and put it on the conveyor over here without moving his feet. So that's a whole bunch of risk factors right there. Um, but he's, you know, he's about probably 18 inches away from his um, feet when he's, uh, when he's lifting here. This gentleman over here, that's another um, issue. He's, he's got the load up higher, which is better for you, except that it's not close enough to the, uh, the vat that he's putting these, these ingredients into for paint. Um, yeah, he's not making cupcakes there with the hazmat suit. This is actually <laughs> a painting. <laughs> so he, he's going to dump that in there, but instead of having it right up next to it and just using a box cutter and, and dumping it in, he's actually still lifting it, which a 50-pound sack is a heck of a lot harder than even a 50-pound box to lift. So um, there's a lot of risk factors here. Okay, some other examples of lifting. Um, out of all of these three, which is the best lift? Is it one, two, or three? Right, correct. He's lifting this die, it, although it's heavy, it's a heavy die, but he's lifting it very close to his body and at waist level. So um, that's the best lift. This gentleman is lifting a very heavy piece of steel up and over away from his body. Um, and, and no one should ever lift any kind of drywall or anything <laughs> like plywood like that because we have so many different lifting devices for that that, that you don't have to do this anymore. Um, so, this is just something that we use when we do a lift comparison for one of those types of reports, the ergonomic assessment report. Um, we're showing um, a lift comparison of lifting things two different ways, okay? This is actually called the 3D biomechanical model, and you might see that in some kind of report that, that you might get sometime, okay? This also, this was a gentleman that it was a laser cutting process. So the laser would cut out forms out of steel or aluminum, and it was heavy gauge steel. Um, and then when all the forms were banged out, so he was banging all the forms out, but then when the, the form, the skeleton was left, he would take that and he would fold it in three different, he would fold it twice, so it was kind of like in a trifold. And then he would lift that up and throw it into a dumpster. I couldn't even, I, I couldn't do this job. I, I tried it, and that was such heavy gauge steel, it was very hard to do. And he did this all night long on his shift. So, you know, it, it, it shows that as far as the shoulder for the male population, only 61% of males would be able to do that job, um, which is below our 75th percentile um, standard threshold. So what we simply did for this individual was we said, well, why are you folding it? He said, well, it has to fit in this dumpster. And I said, well, then where does the dumpster go? Well, then a force truck comes and takes this dumpster and dumps it in a bigger dumpster. So what we did was we, we got a, a, a flat cart and we put it near this work table and now all he simply does is pull the skeleton off the table, slide it to the cart, drop it on the cart, and a fork truck comes and takes that cart and dumps it in a dumpster. So he no longer has to do this. Um, and he did have a shoulder injury. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mary, and she's going to kind of take you, I took you through a little bit of the classroom <coughs> kind of stuff. She's going to do the fun field trip stuff and take you in the field and talk about uh, some of those risk factors. Any questions so far? Um, when Sue and I, you know, go out, we talked a little bit about some of the quantitative tools that we use, but um, there's a variety of different tools that we use as ergonomists that can actually quantify what your risk exposure is, and that's a whole other presentation in, in itself. And um, you know, some of the the words, the tools that you guys might hear out there, you know, the NIOSH lifting equation is a big one, uh, the strain index is a big one. Um, and those are all tools that we use when we go out to kind of justify what our ergonomic recommendations are 
whether or not there's risk out there. It's, it's real objective. Um, so this first picture right here, as you can see, the picture on the left, uh, the workers were required to do some pretty physical assembly of components on this cart. And the cart is, is smaller so that they had to keep some of those components on that lower shelf height. So they were repetitively lifting from the lower shelf height to the top doing the assembly work. You can also see there that the cart on the left has got a lip on it. Um, and they were able, you know, they were required to manually maneuver the parts on the carts which were difficult with that lip. So they were having to manually lift them. So what we did um, and what that employer did was provided the employers, the employees with a larger cart. Um, it had a low friction surface, so sliding the, maneuvering the parts on the cart required less force. They no longer were required to manually lift the components from the bottom shelf to the top shelf. Um, that was all, everything you know, was big enough that they could keep it right on top of the cart. And without a lip on that, they were able to manually slide the part on and off the cart. So we kind of killed a, a bunch of birds um, with one stone with that one cart um, and helped them out there. As you can see, this is more of a palletizing type position where the pictures on the left, these workers did not have a lot of room to move. So there was a lot of twisting, lifting, stacking of boxes. Um, and as you can see, the picture on the top, there was a lot of over shoulder reaching and lifting. So what was implemented in this situation was um, a scissors lift that had a rotation on it. So workers, instead of walking around, reaching, twisting, were able to turn that pallet um, as they were stacking it. It's important to remember that when you implement any kind of ergonomic recommendation, that you don't increase another, you know, uh, another problem. Um, you might add risk. You know, you might implement this this um, recommendation, but by doing so you cause some other problems. So uh, a scissors lift like this, that's automatically going to increase your pallet height. So company-wide, what they did was lower the pallet height to keep it below shoulder height. Um, so that was a company-wide policy that was implemented. And with the rotation, we minimized the amount of uh, twisting and bending required because that was an adjustable height lift. When we look at shoulder risk factors, there are certain things that we want to eliminate or minimize. Um, reaching above shoulder level, reaching behind the back, reaching forward, holding the arm up, or holding the arm out. Who can tell me what the, well, you're, you're an adult, we're talking about the shoulder, so I guess it's not a fair question, but the number one injury for workers over the age of 40, shoulders. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think it's the low back. Low back is a, a, the younger the younger population. A lot of it has to do with the aging workforce, the change in the musculature of the shoulder. So it's very important that we um, minimize the amount of lifting, reaching, um, shoulder postures greater than 90 degrees. Workers are weakest when the upper arm is raised between 90 and 120 degrees or out to the side, shoulder abduction, which would be greater than 60 degrees, which is about there. Um, we put a lot of these ligaments in, in a stretch or a strain, and if you add force to that, you're setting yourself up for rotator cuff tear, which is um, very expensive rehab, surgery, everything that goes with that. And you can see these pictures here just kind of showing some of the things we want to avoid. Heavier lifting above shoulder. Um, you know, it looks like this guy, the, the one in the middle, they do have a barrel tipper that he's just basically guiding, so he's not supporting the weight, so that's a little bit better. And then, you know, carrying large stacks of boxes where he's got to carry them up high. Again, these pictures are just simply demonstrating um, poor shoulder positioning, you know, where there's a lot of reaching out to the side or reaching in front of the body. It's important to remember that when you're reaching in front of the body like this, you're pretty much 
above 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. Um, so it's generally, it's not considered overhead work, but you're still putting that shoulder at an at-risk posture. So we really want to keep minimize the amount of horizontal reaching involved with tasks. Posture is very important when we look at shoulders, but so is force. We need to address force um, when workers are in non-neutral shoulder positioning. So um, this individual was required to, I believe, remove a cap from a product that involved a lot of force. And you can see he's, he's pretty much at about 90 degrees of shoulder abduction. So putting a lot of strain on that rotator cuff. The picture on the right uh, is using a pretty heavy sledgehammer to secure bolts into um, a fixture. So again, we want to look at ways that we can minimize the amount of force and put that worker in a better posture, whether it be from tools, engineering controls. <coughs> now this was a very interesting one. This is one that's, that uh, Sue provided the pictures for. Um, just a little explanation first. The picture on the left, you can see these are the controls right up here. Um, and you know, this is kind of like ugly baby syndrome for these engineers. I don't know this engineer that designed this press or this mold, but the workers were having to reach over a hot molding plate to activate that machine. And I believe the cycle time was approximately 90 seconds. And the women that were doing this were fairly short. So obviously they're vertical reaching, um, there's risk involved with that. And um, the hopper up here, they had to load the hopper and they would just, you know, have this kind of flimsy ladder type step ladder thing where they'd be reaching up and, and putting the, the product in there. So pretty simple solution. Um, what they did was implemented uh, just a sensor that would activate that press rather than having to reach over and um, activate the press using those push button controls. Um, they also, in the meantime, provided a more stable ladder platform with railings up to that hopper so that they had um, a little bit more um, security, but I, they were looking to automate that process using a battery <coughs> lift. But, you know, a lot of times it just takes a, you know, a, a, a person to come in from the outside to see these things because they're so used to doing it a certain way um, that, you know, but in, in fact, when I talked to the engineer about making those changes, he said, why? It's good for me. <laughs> and I just said, yeah, but you're like six feet. Three. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's one of those. So, <laughs> so the picture on the left, what do you guys think? What's the first thing that you see that, that might be an issue? No. Yes, correct. Right. And these, these um, workers on this line were frequently doing that monitor. I mean, for looking for, you know, wh whatever information that was up there. Um, so obviously, you've got a lot of uh, neck flexion. Um, the keyboard and the mouse were, were up high, chest tight, so they were, you know, having to key like this. So, you know, obviously, you just, you know, and there was a lot of, there was some overhead lighting that provided that um, had a lot of glare. So they implemented some task lighting, lowered the monitor, lowered the keyboard, lowered the mouse, um, so that uh, workers were at a little bit better postures. When they're when they're working on that computer, and Sue, so if you have anything to add, um, so when we're looking at elbow, uh, some of the things we want to minimize or some of the things we want to eliminate uh, would be repetitive elbow bending, flexion, extension, um, force. If we're dealing with a lot of force, working with the elbows flexed greater than 90 degrees, working with the palm up or the palm down for prolonged periods of time, or you know, repetitive rotation. Gripping with the arms extended, and resting the arms on a hard surface. So any kind of external compression to the forearm or um, the wrist area would be something that we want to give us a red flag as to, let's, let's see what we can do here. So the picture on the left, the individual was cleaning out a barrel using a long-handled tool where it was very repetitive flexion extension associated with force. Um, so um, in the picture on the right, it's a little bit difficult to see. Uh, obviously, he's in a very confined area. He's actually holding a wrench with his right extremity 
to secure a valve, and then with his left extremity, he's turning the valve. So elbow extension, a lot of force involved. Um, we, can, we can find some, a better way to do that. So just a little participation on your part. So do you feel like you're stronger with the palm up or with your palm down? And you can even you know, hold a glass in your hand with your palm up or anything that you have there. And then palm up, and then you may hold it with your palm down. Which way is easier? <laughs> palm up, right. Because you really can pull in your biceps when you're lifting something with the palm up. But you'd be amazed how many times we, we see out in the facilities where they're lifting with the palm down, especially large guys that have you know big, big hands. Um, Like, like this picture on the left, they're grasping um, pretty heavy hands with the, with the palm down repetitively throughout the day. So there was some redesign that we had to do there. Um, and again, you know, obviously the extension, want to minimize the amount of extension required also. I have a question. So sure. if you're doing that like what he's doing, mm -hmm. is that actually going to be his elbow that's going to be affected or something in here more and the wrists and stuff? Elbow, elbow, forearm, wrist. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, it brings into the shoulder with the amount of extension that he's, okay. you know, the amount of reaching that he's, he's doing there. <laughs> well, you know, all, all the muscles that, you know, do your wrist yeah. and your fingers, the extension and flexion of your fingers are, are in your forearm. And they attach so, to your, you know. Okay. Right. Because <laughs> I'm waiting for you to get to like the keyboard, the desk stuff. I don't know if you're gonna get to that or not. Yeah, well, we'll touch on that a little okay. bit. But yeah, we. we I mean, and if, and if we don't, come talk to us afterwards. Okay. <laughs> if we don't answer your question, and if there's specific examples too that you have at your facility, feel free to to bring them up too. Because like I said, it's hard to know where everyone's coming from, what kind of environments you guys are working in. So. So when we're looking for wrist, you know, wrist and hands, that something, some of the red flag areas, um, something we might want to address, twisting or wringing motion, um, any kind of tool use that you know they might have some external compression to the palm area. Um, we want to look at you know significant deviations from neutral. Obviously, neutral, neutral posture. You know, this would be pretty significant flexion, extension, radial deviation is when your wrist is kind of towards your thumb. All their deviation is when your wrist is kind of going out towards your little finger. Um, any kind of pounding, um, cold tools, we want to look at the environment, um, things like that. Vibration exposure, pinching with force. If the diameter of the tool is too small or too large for that individual, that's going to affect the amount of force that can be generated. The use of a single digit say a pistol grip tool that requires only one digit versus three digits. We like to see more muscle groups being used, um, more fingers being used to do a uh, task. Torque reaction or kickback, that's important um, when we have um, power tools, things like that. We want to address the kickback because obviously they're the workers exerting force to uh, stop that tool from moving. Glove size is very important. Anytime you have someone that's wearing improper fitting gloves, it's going to decrease the amount of force that they can generate. Um, when gloves should be worn in appropriate situations, when workers are performing any kind of torquing or pulling tasks, gloves, a proper fitting glove can, can actually help increase the amount of strength they can generate when they're doing that type of task. But if the gloves are too big, if they're not, if they're worn for you know a fine motor or um, you know manual dexterity, if they're going to have to generate more force to do that task. So um, it's important to you know kind of look at at what they're using, what they're doing, and and the, how that glove is fitting. And vibration. Um, a lot of tools pose risks of vibration exposure for workers, so we want to limit the vibration. A power grasp, you're going to be able to use your entire hand, all your fingers, your thumb to complete.
complete that task. A pinch grasp, obviously, you can only generate a certain amount of force and less force than you could if you were doing it using a power grasp. So there are situations where we would like to see a power grasp versus a pinch grasp and um, can make some changes on that. Uh, basically from this slide, what I just want you to take away is that the grip span is directly related to how much force can be generated. Um, so it affects grip strength. And tools, you know, you have smaller tools to do finer work, which is fine because you're not having to generate a lot of force. But if you have a real small diameter tool that's required to generate a lot of force, it's going to be difficult for that worker to have to exert more force. That diameter is not appropriate for that individual. So here was an ergo opportunity that the, what you see on the left is a manual caulk gun that required quite a bit of pressure and force to get that caulk out of that caulk gun. So we're talking upper extremity, shoulder, forearm, wrist. Um, and it took quite a bit of time to use that manual repetitive pumping of that caulk gun. So what was implemented was a battery operated caulk gun. When you change the tool, you change the weight of that tool. That weight of the tool increased using the battery. But after an overall review of the risk, um, it was quicker. It did involve the manual pumping. So overall, we decreased the overall risk. Even though the tool was, the weight increased slightly, um, the duration of using that tool was significantly decreased. And the force to use that tool was decreased. So here's another question for you. We can um, so make a fist, neutral position, and squeeze as hard as you can. <coughs> and now turn your fist in towards your body about 45 degrees and squeeze. Do you, do you feel how much strength that you lost? So how much strength do you think you lost? It's 40. But just by moving your wrist that much, just a little bit, is really going to decrease the amount of strength that you can generate. So posture is very important when we look at tool use, uh, things like that. We really want to um, get these, these workers in a neutral position when they're using tools. And again, you know, the further deviation from neutral, the less strength a worker will be able to generate. Here's a, um, an ergo opportunity. The picture on the left shows a pistol grip drill, and the air connection, there's a swivel fitting right here, which is great. It increases the mobility of the tool, so they can get that mobility from that swivel rather than from their shoulder. Um, that's great, that's, but the workers were having a very difficult time securing and taking off that connection because of the fact it was moving on. So they were having to exert more force to stabilize um, you know, the gun when they were connecting and disconnecting the air hose. So simple solution, they just moved the swivel fitting. So the swivel fitting was moved um, below the connection. Um, so they, they maintained the mobility of the tool and it was a lot easier to, for them to connect and disconnect the hose. We like to see power tools being used. We like to see smart tools being used wherever possible. Um, and you know, when we, we look at hand tools, we look to you know standard. I mean, obviously, it depends on how frequent, frequently they're being used, things like that. But we like them not to weigh more than 2.5 pounds. And if they do weigh more than 2.5 pounds, we're going to look at how often they're using them, and if we can implement some sort of suspension for those tools so that the worker um, doesn't mean to support the weight of the tools that suspension is going to do that for them. And also with vibration, a guideline, we don't like to see people using vibratory tools for more than two hours in an eight hour day. We love to see task variability, grasp release of tools, um, a lot of variability throughout the day to provide those work, to, to give those workers some uh, recovery time throughout the shift. I have a question about vibration sure. tools. Um, like a jackhammer mm -hmm. thing? Like, how, what injuries would come from that on a 10-hour shift? Well, jackhammers can get very, very heavy. Mm -hmm. I've seen jackhammers that weigh 75, 80 pounds. Guiding, um, 
So, I mean, you have vi vibration exposure, hand arm vibration syndrome mm -hmm. um, is very difficult to treat. We have Reynolds syndrome, Reynolds, mm -hmm. Reynolds. Um, but you're also dealing with, you know, if they're statically grasping that mm -hmm. tool forcefully to guide the tool, you're looking at upper extremity. Um, if they're having to manually lift and reposition, you're looking at shoulder. Depending on their posture, if they're having to reach confined areas, you're looking low back. So it, you can have a whole gamut of stuff going on there. Um, the situation that, I mean, is it a specific situation that... No, I just think, like, my husband works in construction, and he's on that all day. And yeah. And he comes home, and he wears braces on his arms. Right. You know, and he wouldn't ever say anything at well, work, but... And, and you know the thing is, I mean, with construction projects, it's very hard to engineer out a lot of these risk factors because of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at a job where it was actually construction of a bridge, where this guy used a jackhammer mm -hmm. all day long, and I mean, it, that was needed to be done. He didn't do it throughout the entire year, but for the first week of that project, it was all jackhammer. Mm -hmm. So, it's difficult. It's it's a high risk. That's very high risk. Yeah. And when you get into some of those jackhammers, I mean, anti-vibration gloves aren't gonna <laughs> right. <laughs> and I don't even like to call them anti-vibration because that means like there, there's right. no way. I'm, I mean, maybe vibration minimizing, but yeah. not really anti. So yeah, I mean, you can and then for better tools, but yeah. I mean, the best thing that we can do is is to implement um, a lot of micro breaks, a lot of tasks. You know, if we can have these guys um, rotate job duties. Okay, you're on the jackhammer for an hour, and then you're going to go somewhere else and you're going to do something else, and then you can come back to it. I mean, that's that's the best case that we can do there. Thank you. And you know, it's it's important to maintain the tools in the best working conditions for the job. I always recommend routine tool audits where dull bits are, are replaced, dull blades are replaced. Um, you have overhead track systems, but those, those track systems are evaluated. Wheels on carts, they can get full of gunk. You, you know, they need to be maintained. Every, you know, like we maintain our bodies, we need to maintain our tools that do the job and the equipment that we, that we need. And you know, one of the things I see a lot in assembly type positions is people using their hand as a hammer. You see that so much. And you know, this is a very sensitive area, and this is your carpal tunnel. You have every single finger, ligament, tendon going through that small area. So any kind of banging there that can increase um, inflammation or anything like that is obviously a risk factor for a carpal tunnel. Okay. So little bit of office stuff um, you know back in the day everything you know you were on your com computer carpal tunnels were always work related computer entry it wasn't even a question now what they're finding is that if your workstation is set up appropriately and you're not in extreme postures or there's not a lot of external compression that you're really at no higher risk of developing carpal tunnel than someone that's not on a computer um, so it's important to have an ergonomically correct um, workstation. And you know, one of the things too we see a lot in office is you know the contact stress from the from the edge of the desk. We see that out in industry too. We really, especially for the older worker, because there's some some circulatory compromise that happens when we get older. Um, we really want to make sure that we're not posing a risk from contact stress, and we're using padded edges. We're using um, proper, you know, adjustability so that workers aren't required to rest um, their their forearms on any kind of sharp object. That also, you know, goes for the back of the legs if they're sitting or um, whatever the case may be. So this is this is just a picture that demonstrates three very different workstations. And there's no one perfect workstation. It's very dependent on what that worker does throughout the day. The, 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 the workstation up here, very rarely is she on her computer. She's basically just handling files. So all of her you know, paperwork is in front of her. I mean, it looks messy. You might think, well, that's awful. You know, that's probably what my workstation looks like. I probably have the, the least ergonomically correct. I don't really practice what I preach. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the one on the, the bottom left, you know, maybe the, you know, the phone's a little bit closer or, you know, it just, 
A lot of it has to do with what the worker does, what their what their primary job tasks are throughout the day. And obviously, um, some things that are wrong and some things that are right. Up here, this picture up here, obviously we have a lot of elbow flexion, neck extension. She's not utilizing the back support. Um, so that not, not a great setup, <laughs> as you can see. Um, the picture over here could be some external compression there from the desk edge, uh, leaning forward, not utilizing back support. What we want to see when we look at office workstations is we want to see adjustability. We want to see that worker moving around throughout the day, changing postures, things like that. But most importantly, we want to make sure that the shoulders are relaxed. They're not up here hiking their shoulders. Um, they're not reaching out here for the mouse or for the keyboard. Um, real neutral shoulder positioning. Um, we also want to see neutral neck positioning. So, um, you know, generally a rule of thumb is the horizontal line of sight is near the top of that viewing screen. Because your optimum viewing angle is going to be your horizontal line of sight and 30 degrees below. So. Uh, we don't want to see people looking up, looking down. We see that a lot with people that wear bifocals. Um, external compression, we don't want to see external compression to the wrist from the desk edge. We want to see neutral wrist positioning, no extreme flexion. So adjustability is key. The, the, the workstations that have adjustable keyboard trays with mouse attachments, adjustable monitor heights, adjustable chairs that have adjustable lumbar support, um, those are going to be your best um, workstations. So, um, any also, questions? If people are using um, laptops, uh, like so many of us do, yeah, uh, that's that's fine to work on a laptop for a small amount of time. But if you're working on it for eight hours, you should really have external components. Yeah, like a, a stand, like a regular external keyboard. Um, a lot of times, what I recommend, and this is what I do at home, is. You know, I, I position my laptop directly on a, on a stand, and I have a, a standard keyboard on a tray that I just, and a mouse that just plugs right into my laptop whenever I put it there, and then we're good to go with a wrist rest and things like that. So, any questions regarding office? Yes? Yeah, what do you think about using the exercise balls as chairs? I think for short duration, and Sue might have a different opinion. Uh, you know, basically, it, it's all what that worker's comfort is. Um, but if you're using the exercise ball, it might increase their fatigue because they're they're using their core muscles and things like that for for a short period of time if they're comfortable and their heights are fine and things like that. I don't find it much, but yeah, I get this question a lot actually. And um, you know, my philosophy is exercise balls are for exercise. So if you're going to sit on it for, like Mary said, 20, 30 minutes. I don't really have a problem. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. Um, but, you know, if you're going to say to sit on it for an eight hour day, you know. No, you it's, it's going to cause a lot of fatigue. Yeah, it's you need a back rest. Yeah. There's so much compressive force. It, it, really, sitting is very, very difficult on our backs. And so to not have that back support um, increases the compressive forces on your back and really um, gets you fatigue easily um, and then you can have all sorts of problems. So. What about a um, sit stand desk? So the desk great, the desk. great, perfect. I'd love to see more of those out there. But then it's important when you do implement those sit stands to have you know proper chairs and, and things like that. I had a question, but back to the, the exercise of the balls to sit on. Is that if, if someone was to use it, do you recommend the ones with the base? The most co well, yeah, most companies won't let you use it at all if you don't have that base just for liability of, you know, falling off. But I've, I've been to places where actually the ball has deflated because, you know, because it hasn't been in a base. It rolled over something and you're sitting on it. Someone was sitting on it and, and it deflated <laughs> as they were sitting. So, I mean, it's a huge liability for, for um, companies, too. But, yeah, if, if you're going to do it, I would recommend the base. But I mean, usually that honestly, I mean, I don't know how someone could be comfortable using an exercise ball all day long. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Well, 
they've got little air yeah, cushions yeah. that are meant to do the same thing, but you just put them on your chair like a chair pad, and it's like a little mm -hmm. pillow. Mm -hmm. It's and like a bo yeah. almost like a bow ball or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've seen those too. Yeah. Again, I mean, it's it's all if they're changing their posture throughout the day, they're not. You know, they're utilizing some lumbar support to, you know, with the fatigue factor. And, I mean, you kind of get that, you know, everyone's so, like, into exercise and everything. And, and this is, like, in the industrial setting. I run into it all the time, too. Here these guys have these hoists, these overhead cranes, but yet they choose to manually lift 50-pound parts because they're getting their workout. Well, no, you no. <laughs> That doesn't happen at the workplace. Do that on your own time. You know, if, if these companies, and a lot of times they don't make it policy. You need to make it policy. Um, but I mean, this obviously is a little bit different. <laughs> but you know, as long as they're 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 mixing it up throughout the day, I I don't have any problem with it. I mean, it's not gonna hurt them. Go ahead. Um, if you have an ergonomic workstation, this would be a desk. Mm -hmm. um, would you ever see causation for repetitive stress type injuries? Wrist. Elbow, shoulder. If it's set up appropriately, and I was able to, you know, like I said, I, there's still doctors out there that that might say that this is work related. Um, depending on, you know, we want we want to see recovery time there. I mean, are they doing dictations for ten hours a day, where they're static posture for ten hours a day? Yeah. Um, I or have a lot of coders, so they're they that they're inputting pretty much today. Yeah, um, I guess it would depend on um, you know their posture and, and the duration throughout the day, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that when, whenever we see, and, and I think Mary's on the same page as I am, when we see a, an ergonomically correct workstation, and you know there are micro breaks, or you can get up away from your workstation, then we all flipping through papers, yeah, you're on the phone, yeah, right. you're doing other we things. We ask the question, okay, is there diabetes here? Yeah, high blood pressure, pregnancy, thyroid. <laughs> yeah, I had carpal tunnel five times every yeah. with every pregnancy. I had carpal tunnel, so it was you know it, it does happen. Yeah. Well, I know there are good. body types that can't, can't. I could not do that kind of work. I'd have right. something going on in my arm. And well, if it's important, you know, you still have doctors out there that are stuck in their ways and like, yeah, it's work related. Mm -hmm. But doctors that generally do more of a whole holistic type approach and look to see, you know, okay. What other factors play a role? There's a lot of factors that play a role in carpal tunnel, not just the work environment. And like Steve right. touched and that's, on, that's where we can come in to help, or an ergonomic expert can come in to help, saying, "Okay, we see the mechanism of injury here, or we don't see the mechanism of injury here." So when the doctor gets all of that information, then he or she can make the determination if it's work related. And it's important to remember too is that it's very specific to that individual because. Um, we're all different, and you know, there's there's some workers that have a tendency to pound on their keys, or um, have a tendency to hold their hands up above the keyboard, so in their static contraction. Um, there's there's ways, you know, there, it's all in the technique too. It's not just the workstation, it's not just their posture, but it's we need to look at the whole picture. Any other questions? So it's good to say that every company should have one of you working for them. Perfect. <laughs> right? Right? Because, you know, good and bad. Like, if there's any situation, anything that would come up, you know, you're going to come in and give your professional honest opinion on it. Not right. That I mean, there's Sue and I testify. The company I mean, or the employee. Yeah. We, we do a lot of testifying in court for causation yeah. for workers' comp. Um, it is sometimes best to have someone from the outside come in because it's going to stand up better in court um, and you can, you know, so. We work with a lot of companies on preventative programs mm -hmm. also. Yeah. I work with one company that I manage their on uh, their uh, self-assessment for office ergonomics. Mm -hmm. they, they do a computer program and after they try to fix things on their own, if they still have pain or issues, then I go to see them. But there's a, uh, there's a whole uh, learning component in that. And, you know, we, we, do a lot of different things. There's a lot of creative things that right. you can do. To and we're going to have business, you know, feel free to use us as a resource. I mean, oh, yeah, we absolutely. have business cards. There's a lot of times, well, I'll just get a call from say, hey, Mary, we got this going on. What do you think? Do we need a real detailed quantitative eval? Can you point me in the right direction of, of what you might think we might need here? Or sometimes I mean, they'll send us a picture. Right. This is what we're thinking about changing on this 
a piece of equipment, especially if you've been in the plant before. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think? Do you think this is this is at this height? Right. Now we're going to change it to this height. Is this a good change? You know, we get questions like that all the time. Well, we don't even have to necessarily come on site for every little thing, but you know, we get employers that just bounce things off of us all the time. Yeah, we love it. We also say we're not like attorneys, we don't charge for those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any attorneys here. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Like I said, we have cards here, and, and um, thanks again for having us. Yeah. Although I'll probably be off for a few weeks. So. <laughs> we'll, so, cover, we'll cover for her yeah. until she gets back. <laughs> So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, ladies, for um, joining us. And thank all of you guys for coming to um, our awareness lunch. Our next um, event is going to be a company tour of Parker Hannafin, and that's coming up um, the end of April. I believe it's the 23rd. Um, and then in May, we have um, Doctors at Di Romano. Is that how you say his name? Um, he's going to talk to us about kind of getting ready to in the spring and you know how to maybe prevent some of those brain strains that kind of thing because eventually it's going to get nice outside right <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you everyone I said you were in the <laughs> <laughs>